The Cartoon History of the Universe, Volume 5, Brains and Bronze. Prologue. For the first 10 centuries of civilization, the Greeks were not in Greece. Before 2000 BC, their ancestors lived up north somewhere, while the lands around the Aegean Sea belonged to a people called the Pelasgians. Voices from the north? What are they saying? It's Greek to me. Pelasgian lands included the countless Aegean Islands, where archaeologists have found the remains of Stone Age farming settlements, complete with barnyard animals brought from the mainland. Let us pause briefly to honor the unknown Pelasgian pioneers who first put to sea with pigs. It was on the greatest of these islands, Crete, that Aegean civilization was born. A new home, piggies! The Cretan language is long gone, so no real history is possible. But thanks to some magnificent relics and ruins, we do have a series of images. The great goddess and her snakes. Dolphin murals. Pottery painted with spirals and octopi. Peaceful towns, unprotected by walls or forts. Rambling colonnaded palaces, equipped with modern plumbing. Nothing like it again until a hundred years ago. Evidence of periodic earthquakes. A dancer! A dance! We'll leave the interpretation of all this to the experts. Possible evidence of an early matriarchy. A society utterly without strife, ruled by a priestess queen, where all interactions were between consenting adults. Yes, and every year the queen chose a fresh, juicy young husband who killed the old king in ritual wrestling. Then, after watering the fields with his blood, they performed unspeakable sex acts with a bull See so why I leave it to the experts? The earliest Greeks were a branch of the unwashed, nomadic Indo-European peoples who first harnessed the horse. Let's go south for the millennium. I could use a vacation. As usual, the first horsemen were unstoppable. This invasion may account for the myth of the centaurs. Animals, half man, half horse. Though the Greeks arrived in Greece in prehistoric times, we can still see something of the event in certain Greek words of non-Greek origin. These include place names. Mm? Corinthos. Some native herbs and plants. Hyacinthos. Mm? Minthos. Mm? Absinthos. <laughs> and customs unknown to the first Greeks like Agamenthos. A bath! Hmm? Phew! I thought you'd never ask. It didn't happen overnight, but by 1400 BC, the Greeks had imposed their language and culture on the land, even conquering Crete. There's no question the Pelasgians felt imposed on. Just look at the massive walls that the Greeks built to protect themselves. This is the gate at Mycenae, their greatest city. From the natives, they learned the arts of cultivation. Olives and grapes, that's what they cultivated. While the wretched Cretans cultivated opium for their pain, as this puppy-headed goddess can testify. <laughs> yep. Finally, about 1200 BC, the whole civilization went up in smoke. The palaces were sacked and burned, fueled by the drums of olive oil stored in the basement. A non-apology. I'm not sorry. What we've seen so far has been based mainly on archaeological evidence, relics and such. And a pretty bare outline it is. Now I'd like to flesh in the details using the literary evidence. Those famous myths and legends handed down from ancient times by the Greeks themselves. Not all of these are tales of gods and monsters. 
some have a definite historical flavor. For instance, Helen, the legendary ancestor of all Greeks, was said to have sprung from a rock which his father Deucalion tossed over his shoulder shortly after the Great Flood. Dad, where's Mom? Well, that's an origin myth. They're always weird. But as we approach the time of decline and fall, the legends get downright believable. And even if they're not true, they can certainly tell us something about the people who made them up. So, with that pitiful excuse, here is the Greeks' own version of the collapse of Mykene. It's not history, but it's not bad. A couple of curses. It began, they say, with the pushy Pelops, king of Elis. The story goes that Pelops won the throne in a chariot race, first bribing the old king's driver, then pitching him into the sea. Being a king is something like giving birth. You've got to know when to push. Pelops' descendants ruled so many cities that the southern half of Greece is called the Peloponnese. One of his sons, Atreus, became king of Mycenae, while another one, Thyestes, seduced Mrs. Atreus. In revenge, Atreus had some of Thyestes' children cooked up. <laughs> then served them at dinner to their dad. Finger fit, Thyestes? <coughs> Thyestes fled, retching and leveling a fearsome curse against Atreus and all his house. It made something really bad happen to your children, you, you son of Pelop. Eh, it takes one to know one. Didn't you like my stuffed grape leaves? We'll expect your resignation in the morning. Now the scene shifts to Thebes, ruled by Queen Jocasta and King Laos. Laos, too, lived under a curse. Anything I can do to help, dear? No, it just seems to go with the job. Years earlier, Laos had been forced to flee Thebes and take refuge at the court of Pelops. Before returning home, for some reason, he kidnapped one of Pelops' sons, and hence the curse. May your own son kill you, Theban! So, when Jocasta bore a baby boy, they spiked its heels and exposed it on the slope. The child was rescued by shepherds and adopted by the king and queen of Corinth, who named him Oedipus, Swollen Foot. A likely story, you say? See Volume 4. Years later, the young prince was moving down the road with murder on his mind. My feet are killing me. At a crossroads, he happened to run into his father, Laos, who was coming home from Delphi. <laughs> what it? Who are you telling to watch it? In those days, every stranger was an enemy and every meeting a fight. When this one was over, Laos was dead in the road. By the gods, a man can only take so much traffic. Oedipus moved on to Thebes, found the position of king open, and after passing a strange qualifying exam, he got the job, and Jocasta, his mother, as wife. The unsuspecting couple lived happily for years. Hmm, don't I know you from somewhere? Get serious. Oedipus, arriving at Thebes after killing his father Laos, found the city menaced by a sphinx, strangler in Greek. The monster kept asking this riddle and eating anyone who guessed wrong. What goes on four legs, two legs, three legs? A mutant cockroach? <laughs> Oedipus solved the riddle. Men. And the sphinx self-destructed goes the story because man crawls during infancy and leans on a cane in old age. To the Greeks, this legend explained why the Thebans were too busy to look for Laos' murderer, and how Oedipus won the throne. For a modern skeptic, however, the riddle of the Sphinx remains. Namely, what was that Sphinx? Well, not for you to know, skeptic! Years pass. A plague is raging in Thebes. Every attempt is made to appease the gods. But after all the sheep, goats, cows, and doves are sacrificed, the plague rages on, and Oedipus wants to know why. The seers say it's a case of unpunished guilt. Somebody has murdered his father and married his mother and got away with it! Yuck! Let's find the reprobate. After an intensive investigation, 
everything falls into place. I took a baby from her and gave it to him. I took it to Corinth and you should have seen its feet. Seen its feet. <laughs> Dawn breaks over Marblehead. <laughs> Jocasta runs into the palace and hangs herself. Oedipus pulls the golden brooches from her dress and plunges their points into his eyes. I've seen too much. His beard be dewed with eyeballs. The king is led away forever by his daughter, Antigone. Well, I always wondered what was wrong with my feet. Argonauts. Ah, what an age. The age of Oedipus and Atreus, when every stranger was an enemy. A heroic games, that's what it was. And here's a whole shipload of heroes aboard the Argo, sailing in search of the Golden Fleece. Never mind what it was, except that it was gold and didn't belong to them. Orpheus, whose songs could tame the savage beasts. Heracles, mightiest of men, at one time married to Oedipus' cousin before he killed her. Jason, captain of the Argo. Castor and Pollux, twins from Sparta. The Greek interest in music goes back at least as far as Orpheus, the legendary harpist whose tunes were said to have soothed the very birds, beasts, and barbarians. In fact, he soothed the barbarians so well that their jealous wives killed Orpheus with kitchen gear. <laughs> But even then, goes the legend, Orpheus's head kept singing. Oh, I'm the headless horseman. What means this? A symbolic way of saying his songs live on, perhaps? Heracles versus the Hydra. What's a monster like you doing in a history book? Who's gonna keep me out? We'll skip the details, saying only that Heracles was accidentally left behind to go freelance, while the rest of the Argonauts went on a long spree of kidnapping, murder, battle, and pillage. The points being, first, during this heroic age, plunder was replacing productive labor. Law and order were collapsing, and it wasn't so easy to tell the heroes from the outlaws. <coughs> Second, to reach the goal, the Argonauts had to pass through the narrow straits guarded by the strategic city of Troy. In fact, one legend says that Heracles led an attack on Troy a generation before the Great War. The young Heracles, it said, studied music from the great lutist Linus, who made the mistake of criticizing his pupil. Muscle-bound lummox, how can you make music with fingers like that? You're right. So Heracles killed Linus with his own lute. This story shows how heroes are not always good, just excessive. <laughs> now I'm sorrier than ten ordinary men. Now back to Thebes. Oedipus' sons vied for the throne. One, Eteocles, got it, while the other, Polynices, roamed Greece in search of allies. In the name of social decay! Six heroes, each with his private army, followed Polynices back to Thebes' seven gates. The seven against Thebes. All died in the battle, including the two brothers, who killed each other. For the trouble his sister had burying Polynike's body, see Sophocles' tragedy, Antigone. The walls of Thebes had held, but not for long. A few years later, an invading tribe, the Boy Oceans, joined by the avenging sons of the six fallen heroes, drove out the old rulers and made Thebes a Boy Ocean town. Serves them right! Yeah, the way they carried on here! This second Theban war, it turned out, was just the preliminary to the main event. Soon, this new generation of heroes would be at Troy, and the curse against Atreus would be fulfilled. The Trojan War Before sallying forth to battle, let's return to Mycenae for a bit more background. 
Atreus' sons, Agamemnon and Menelaus, had gone shopping for the best wives money and power could buy. They traveled to Sparta, ruled by the gorgeous Queen Leda, who had made it with a swan in her youth, it was said. No, no. <laughs> Leda had two daughters. One, Clytemnestra, went home with Agamemnon, while the other, Helen, kept Menelaus and made him king of Sparta. Goofy, goofy, goofy. A bit later, some tourists from Troy came calling at Sparta. The Trojan prince Paris fell hard for Helen, as who wouldn't? I'd like to see you in orange sauce, my dog. The next morning, the lovers were gone. Dear Menelaus, I love Paris in the springtime. Sincerely, Helen. <laughs> this was even worse than it looked. Remember, Menelaus was king only because he was married to Helen. And now, he went to his big brother for help. It's more than a question of honor, Aggie. Our family's wealth and power depend on <laughs> getting back my goosey. <laughs> you see? I see, I see. So Agamemnon, now High King of Mykene, sounded the call to arms. We'll get her, and clear her out to the Black Sea, too. Oh, thank you, thank you. In Greek mythology, Zeus, King of the Gods, is forever falling in love with mortal women. <coughs> he came to Europa as an irresistibly beautiful bull. Love your calves, Europa. <coughs> to Alcmene, Heracles' mother, as her husband's double. <coughs> and there were many more besides. These myths may have, A, reflected the ways of Greek women. There's Penelope looking for Zeus among the pigs again. <coughs> B. Offered role models for Greek men. Uh, you could say I was playing God. Or C. Explained some inexplicable pregnancies. So I'm walking through the field when along comes this gorgeous duck. Zeus! From every corner of Greece, the armies gathered at Aulus and made ready to sail. The feast that launched a thousand ships. Wow! Unfortunately, the wind kept blowing the wrong way, and the Greeks, at this stage of their history, didn't know how to tack into the breeze. After a few weeks' wait, the restless army was ready to believe the priest, who said the gods were mad at Agamemnon. Only one way to get a good wind, he has to sacrifice his daughter Iphigenia. <laughs> Torn between duty to brother, love of daughter, sympathy for wife, and fear of army, Agamemnon tricked Clytemnestra into bringing Iphigenia to the sacrifice. You haven't heard the last of this boy! But Clytemnestra! <laughs> the wind finally changed, and the vast flotilla set sail. Loot! Village! Rape! Bay! From all over the countryside, people crowded into Troy, prepared for a long siege. The Greeks set up camp near the beach and demanded Helen's return. We'll wait as long as it takes. The Trojans refused, and the war began, and dragged on and on. The Greeks came and went. The Trojans held out, but we get no clear picture of the action until the war's ninth year, described in Homer's great epic, the Iliad. Number one, the Iliad begins when Agamemnon pulls rank to take a slave girl away from his best captain, Achilles. By the gods, I'm the king! Number two, Achilles, sulking, removes his men from combat, and things go badly for the Greeks. Number three, Agamemnon begs him to relent, but Achilles is too proud. I apologize, you can have the girl, and gold, and horses, and my daughter. The one that's still alive, just fight! No. Why not? Because you're a jerk. Number four. <laughs> Only when his best friend, Patroclos, is killed by the Trojan hero, Hector, does Achilles return to battle. <laughs> Number five. Achilles gets Hector with one shot to the neck.
then drags the body around by its heels with his chariot. But still, the Trojans won't give up Helen. For comic relief, sort of, here's Hector chasing another Greek Odysseus, both in heavy armor, three times around the walls of Troy. Small town. The Egyptian version of the Trojan War. The kidnapper, Paris, on his way home to Troy with his captive Helen, stopped in Egypt, where he was hauled before an angry pharaoh. Tisk, kidnapping. When are you people going to be civilized? Four hundred years, that's all I ask. Pharaoh sent Paris packing, but kept Helen behind in Egypt to wait for her husband. She waited ten years. That's because he and the Greeks were at Troy, trying to get her out. We'll wait as long as it takes! Let, let's go! In the tenth year, it said, the Greeks tricked their way into Troy by hiding in the belly of a wooden horse then sacked the city and went home. Homer's other epic, The Odyssey, relates the wanderings of Odysseus, who took ten more years to reach his island safely. Where have you been? Some of the Odyssey sounds like what Odysseus told his wife, Penelope. <laughs> Poor baby. Other parts sound more like stories for his drinking buddies. <laughs> King Agamemnon was less lucky. In his absence, Clytemnestra had taken a lover, Aegisthus, brother of the babies eaten by Atreus. Honey, I'm home. Agamemnon was with Cassandra, a Trojan princess who could see the future too clearly. And suit yourself. <gasps> you look tired. <laughs> Yes, Agamemnon and his prophetess were murdered on the day they arrived. Each dying breath, flung from its breast, swift, bubbling jets of gore, and the dark sprinklings of the rain, blood fell upon me. Not to redirect the rain of heaven to Cornland, when the green sheet teems with green. If only we'd known how to sail into the wind. Clytemnestra and her lover were both killed in turn by Orestes, her own son. What a family! Pursued by furies, Orestes fled, and the house of Atreus perished in war, murder, and madness. Menelao spared little better. He got Helen back. Look what you've done to your brother and my sister and half the world! Why didn't you just leave me alone? Ah, uh, quit your quacking. Eventually, Orestes regained his sanity and, after Menelaos' death, returned to reign as king of Sparta, the lull before the final collapse. <sighs> Dorians and Darkness Around 1200 BC, Greece was invaded by backward northern tribes called the Dorians, after their legendary ancestor Dorus. Forward! Dorians? The Dorians were Greeks too, but their dialect fell harshly on civilized southern ears. Your land I like, that hurts! Relatively unspoiled by civilization, they still enjoyed such tribal institutions as popular assembly. And, like many other tribal people, they could be deeply caring about each other, but horribly mean to outsiders. <laughs> Oh, did you cut your finger, dear? Uh-huh. The Dorians drove all before them, taking most of the Peloponnese and sending refugees scurrying all over the map. There were exceptions. They couldn't conquer the Athenians, who even afterwards claimed to be the true original Greeks, or the Arcadians who preserved the weirdest, most ancient religious rites in their mountain strongholds. The Dorian-driven peoples ended up in the strangest places, Britain for example. And we saw in Volume 4 how desperate sea raiders attacked Egypt and became Israel's enemies.
the Philistines, which may be another way of saying Pelasgians. And one of these volumes, we'll see what all this had to do with China. And so, Greece entered a long dark age. The land was depopulated, the art of writing was lost, and the palaces were sacked. The early Greeks had a system of writing, now called Linear B, based on the pictograms of Crete and used for only one purpose, keeping the palace accounts. Junius Earl's Palace, 2,220 measures of barley, 526 of olives, 468 of wine, 15 rams, 1 ewe, 13 billy goats, etc, etc. Hmm, banker's poetry! When civilization collapsed around 1,200 B.C., and the use of Linear B was completely forgotten, some people must have welcomed illiteracy as one of the bright spots of the Greek Dark Ages, 1,200 to 800 B.C. Uh, you owe, uh, olives. How many olives? Uh, what's this, wine? Here, can you make it out? Hell no. Funny things, Dark Ages. Despite the poverty and illiteracy, it may happen that technology advances anyway, and that's what happened in Greece with metalworking. Before 1200 BC, the only metal used for weapons was bronze. Bronze is made of copper and tin, both fairly rare, especially tin. So only the rich could afford armor. Even then, the Greeks knew about iron. What they knew was... It's no good! Iron was tricky to work, and all too likely to bend, snap, or go blunt. Take this! So for years, they used it only for farm tools. But gradually, the secrets of ironworking spread from their source in Armenia. And sometime during the Dark Ages, good iron weapons appeared in Greece. As did the familiar figure of the blacksmith. In the bronze age, my granddaddy was an iron smith. There is far more iron in the world than copper or tin. And the best iron mines in Greece lay near Sparta. Constitution. The town of Sparta, four villages really, was nestled in the hills above the landlocked plain of Lacedaemon. The Spartans were Dorian lords, suspicious of outsiders, and too proud to dirty their own hands with work. My land! Is this any way for a true Spartan to waste his time? They also disliked dividing up their estates. When a Spartan died, one son inherited, and the rest looked for new land. Here's what's available. <sighs> I was born too late. As Greece emerged from the Dark Ages, around 750 BC, the Spartans were preparing to solve their twin problems, labor and land, by going to war. They began to drill in the new tactics of the hoplite phalanx. A hoplite was a heavily armed foot soldier, and I do mean heavy. Breathe, breathe. Bronze boots, boots, heavy steel, flashing sword, sword, bronze breastplate, breastplate, backplate, backplate. The hoplite's gear was part bronze, part iron. Vicious steel tip spear. <laughs> Helmet with frightening high poop. Helmet with frightening blue. <laughs> Incredibly heavy bronze shield. Shield. <laughs> The phalanx was a tight square, eight men across and eight deep. Okay, Hoplite, march! Well, practice makes perfect, and soon the Spartans were doing left face, right face, double time, and overlapping shields without falling down or stabbing each other too much. Finally, they marched off to enslave their neighbors in the plain of Messenia. <laughs> While the Spartan men were at war, which was often, what about the Spartan women? Well, during Sparta's first war of conquest, the women made some conquests too, among the slaves who remained at home. You wanna raise hell, Hill? When the warriors returned, they were amazed to find a new generation of Spartans. Where did ye come from? Ask your missus. These they dubbed Parthenai, bastards, and banished them forever. 
Oh, don't, don't call on us, you, you, you Parthenai. Parthenai. The Messenians fought hard, and the Hoplites probably hadn't perfected their moves yet, so the war lasted 20 years. Stop pushing! But when it was over, the Spartans had realized their dream of becoming absentee landlords. Also getting some slaves to help with that farmer. Having freed themselves from drudgery and toil, the Spartans now faced the job of holding down a large population of angry subjects. This twisted their society into some pretty odd shapes. The Spartans gave all the credit for their constitution to a great and somewhat mysterious lawgiver, Lycurgos. We can't even say if he was man or god. Although many modern scholars date Lycurgos' reforms after the First Messenian War, the ancients all believed he lived long before, at a time when Spartan society was forever in turmoil. To end this mess goes the story, Lycurgo secretly arranged with some like-minded friends to march into town in full armor. The people agreed to listen. His radical ideas were not easily accepted. Sacrifice or lose all! The lawgiver himself lost an eye in a scuffle with one disgruntled young aristocrat. It's hard to say how much Spartan custom began with Lycurgos, but it's generally agreed he set the tone. To give all true Spartans a stake in the state, the land was redivided among all citizens. It was worked by the Helots, serfs who gave half their harvest to Spartan lords. Spartans must live simply. Silver, gold, and other frills were banned. By law, Spartan ceilings were finished roughly, with an axe. My, how the trees grow in Corinth! <laughs> the emperor, or headman, was elected by the popular assembly. He presided over a council of 30 of the best men, including two kings at a time. <laughs> We've been devalued! <laughs> Eating at home was abolished. All Spartans joined mess clubs and took their meals in common for the rest of their lives. This was a hard law to swallow, they say. And the food is impossible! Spartan women, always independent, remember Helen? enjoyed more rights than women elsewhere in Greece. They did military exercises, owned property, and ran Sparta while the men were at war. Often, come back with your shield or on it. So that all Spartans should know the law, it was never written but sung at festivals from time to time. Never fight too long against one's foe, lest your tactics he should come to know. And more. The Spartan lawgiver, like Hurgos, took all gold and silver out of circulation and replaced them with a currency of iron. The real source of our strength! Sparta had plenty of iron, so this money wasn't worth much. Too bulky to steal, pointless to counterfeit, and not even particularly easy to spend. No rhetoric master, fortune teller, harlot monger, jeweler, or engraver would set foot in a country which had no money. Plutarch, life of Lycurgos. Spartans are raising the unemployment rate. Consequently, Spartans remained immune to foreign vices, trinkets, and marketing skills in general. Money, money, I had some once, but it's all gone to rust. The Spartans put physical fitness first. Sickly babies were exposed to die, and the living weren't pampered. Boys and girls alike trained naked in running, wrestling, and javelin throwing. Other Greeks admired the results. Whoa. The best athletes were sent to the Olympic Games in Elis, founded in 776 BC and held every four years. The Spartans, who started the Olympic custom of competing naked, did well in the events they chose to enter. In the original Olympic Games, the boxing matches were decided only when one contestant conceded defeat. This added an element of machismo to the event. The Spartans, in particular, considered it an awful humiliation to surrender in anything, even sports. How can you ever go home again? Just a thrill to heaven, take a look. So the Spartans would simply boycott the boxing, unless, of course, they were certain to win. Come on, Spartan, let's see how tough you are. Huh, I wouldn't give you the satisfaction. Still, strength and speed weren't enough. Making a hoplite from a Spartan boy also demanded a lifetime of discipline. 
At age seven, he left home and moved into a dormitory. Ah, you can take it. After having his head shaved, he went with the others down to the swamp where they pulled, not cut, reeds for their sleeping mats. I can take it. I can take it. The rations were short and the baths cold and twice a year. I, I can take it. I can take it. At age 12, he turned in his shirt and was issued a cloak, his only clothing and blanket. At age 16, he was sent out alone for several weeks to live like a werewolf. Stealing and murdering helots was encouraged. I could take it. If caught, however, he might be whipped to death, so the others would learn to live with dying. I, I, could, I, could, take, I, I, I could take it. But a Spartan education wasn't only pain. That was also love, or eros as the Greeks called it. The Spartan twist was that this passion was strictly an affair between boys and men. <laughs> Typically, an adult man would find a favorite 12-year-old to woo with favors, presents, and self-magnifying anecdotes. And then I tore his face off using only my little fingers. Wow! The boy was expected to resist, but not forever. Don't fight it. It's classical civilization. Yes, Greek love was something that slipped off the approved list of most later Western religions. The man became the boy's special role model and advisor, even helping his lover choose a wife. You're getting a hot one, sweetie. This friendship was supposed to last a lifetime and to be a big help in keeping a tight phalanx. Say you'll always stand by me. Of course, darling. You taught me to take it. <sighs> it keeps him off the foreign women. <laughs> by now, the reader understands what we mean today by Spartan. Austere, serious, and tough. Our only pleasures are a job well done and a glorious death. To the Spartans, it meant more. Blind obedience, intense pride, mistrust of foreigners, indifference to death, the military virtues. They needed them. As harshly as they treated themselves, the Spartans were that much rougher on their slaves and helots. And so, revolts happened all the time. Spartan revenge was unsparing. After one uprising, 2,000 helots were decked out gaily, then marched out of town and never heard from again. By 550 BC, Sparta was by far the strongest state in Greece and the whole Peloponnese trembled before the Lacedaemonians. But being Spartan also meant being provincial. As a nation of landlocked landlords, Sparta would be more or less untouched by the changes now sweeping the Greek world. Spreading Greece. Caught in the same land squeeze as the Spartans, many other Greeks turned outward to the sea. Landless peasants by the boatload went looking for farms, and by 600 BC, the coast was dotted with countless Greek colonies. Some of these were settled on unclaimed land, some were bought from local folk, and some were taken by force. At Miletus, for instance, the Greeks massacred the men and married the women. Big muscles, huh? Forever afterward, Milesian women would neither eat with their husbands nor address them by name. Your splash snoosh snoosh, Frankie. What? Anyway, at first, the colonists lived by farming. But gradually, they built up some surplus and began thinking about trade. Where would be a good place for these olives, dear? Thank you. A surviving image of the reawakening of trade. The Spartan Commodus coaxing the Cretans down to the coast. Hey, it's all right. Really? Tentatively at first, commerce picked up. And encouraged by their wives, no doubt, the Milesians began founding regular trading posts around the Black Sea. It's good to get away for a while. The Greeks offered the foreigners olive oil, pottery, and wine. Yeah, good. Wine, eh? I like. And what would you like, my brothers? That's, That's right, right, Chief. We like, like your brothers. brothers. In exchange, they took anything handy. Especially slaves. You! What have I done? Don't 
Don't worry, Chief. A little hair of the dog that bit you, and you'll be fine. By 600 BC, merchant vessels jammed the seaways. Ah! Ah! The Sea Traders, Part 2. When the ancient sea traders pulled into a new port, they would unload some cargo, spread it on the dock, and then return to the ship and hide. In return, the townspeople would offer some goods, and then they would hide. If they had offered enough, the deal was done. If not, the seamen stayed on board until the price was made right. In this way, everyone was happy, but no one knew exactly how happy. Suckers! In the course of their travels, the Greeks saw what civilized life was. Not much like their own. I want it! They began madly borrowing ideas from the civilized people across the sea, like the Phoenicians. We've already met these Phoenicians in Volume 4 as the coastal Canaanites of Tyre. Purple dye makers, Phoenix equals purple in Greek, Solomon's architects, Jezebel's relatives, Baal worshippers, and throughout their long history, merchant seamen and colonizers. You people have been around. Around Africa, actually. The Greeks lifted Phoenician religious ideas, shipbuilding tricks, and most important, their alphabet. Once again, Greece was literate. Why, this is so simple, a child could learn it. Good. Are there any children around who can teach it to us? Alpha to Omega. In the Phoenician alphabet, letter names went with letter shapes. Phoenicians said they're oxhouse camels. When the Greeks borrowed the alphabet, they also kept the letter names, even though these were meaningless in Greek. This one's called Alpha. Zeus knows why. Turn it over. It might look less like an ox. The Phoenician letters, as in Semitic alphabets today, were all consonants. The Greeks felt the need for vowels and invented them. Hmm. Something's missing here. Oh? Then there were the Egyptians. Thousands of landless Greeks went to Egypt to fight for hire in Pharaoh's army. Archon, son of Amoibakos, and Ax, son of Nobody, wrote me. Graffiti at Abu Simbel. Others came as businessmen tourists. When about pyramids? Two thousand years old this week. Hmm. But you give discounts? For you, I throw in speed. Impressed with Egypt's wealth, Greek merchants arrived in such numbers that Pharaoh set aside a whole city, Nocritus, for their use. Wow, I just scored this great pyramid. Odd. So did I. The Egyptians, you may recall, invented the colonnade. Ooh. The Greeks combined it with their own motifs and began building those famous temples that look like banks. Seems appropriate somehow. The Greeks were also taken with Egyptian religion and mysticism, actually reshaping some Greek rituals along Egypt's more civilized lines. Try not to be shocked by what follows. In the north of Greece, some country folk worshipped Dionysus, god of wine. The story went that as an infant, Dionysus was torn limb from limb, then miraculously reborn. They honored Dionysus by consuming gallons of his sacred drink and tearing through the countryside by night. In their frenzy, they laid hold of a goat, or bull, or baby. All symbols of Dionysus. And then, with their bare teeth and hands, they would rip it to bits. What came next, nobody seems to remember too clearly. To most Greeks, these rites seemed a trifle rough, and Dionysus was not popular at first. Tisk. Now goes one theory, the scene shifts to Egypt, where a Greek tourist was watching the passion play of the god Osiris. In this myth, King Osiris too was cut to pieces. His queen Isis, locating all his parts with the penis, fitted them together again, added some mummy wraps and a wooden phallus, and restored Osiris to life. Our Greek visitor had a flash. Osiris is Dionysus! Don't tell him about Humpty Dumpty. He studied Osiris' rituals, the drama, the secret doctrines, 
The parade of Osiris puppets, their phalli waggling to celebrate the resurrection of the god. This is so civilized! By comparison... He returned to Greece aflame with his vision. Soon his flame was burning out his neighbors. Listen to this! <laughs> well, our zealot made some converts. And together, they prepared a festival in honor of the new Dionysus. Finally, one night, all was ready. Came the dawn. In such ways, a great religion's born. Sometimes, This combination of getting drunk and letting it all hang out proved irresistible. And the cult of Dionysus, minus the old bloodiness, soon had official support. Yes, I think we can provide city funds for this. Presumably, this went hand in hand with the growth of the wine trade. What are we planting this year? Grapes! As in Egypt, the bloody parts were still acted out in plays, most notably at Athens. The Dionysia always included some new and gory drama of the past. Agamemnon, Oedipus, or Iphigenia, a type of play the Athenians called Goat Song, Tratoida, or as we say, Tragedy, a surviving legacy of the dismembered Egyptian god. Each giant crab splung from his breath, sweet, bubbling jets of gold. Phew, this really tears me apart. Behind the orgies and parades of the Dionysus cult was a secret side, the Orphic Mysteries. In the 500s BC, someone wrote sacred poems and passed them off as the work of the legendary Orpheus. A miracle! <laughs> but the ink is still wet. Well. Their story. Earth begat the Titans, who begat Zeus, who begat Dionysus, whose flesh was eaten by jealous Titans. Zeus crisped the titans with a thunderbolt. And humans arose from their ashes. The message. Human nature is part earthly from the titans and part divine from the flesh of Dionysus they had eaten. And this divine spark gives us eternal life. It's a wonderful idea. Yes, and the best part is you never know uh, if it's true to you dead. Let's be rational. As trade and slavery increased, the colonial founding father farmers began to lose touch with progress, and in many cities were overthrown by revolution. The new rulers, dictators called tyrants, served the commercial classes, putting the slaves to work in proving harbors, marketplaces, and other public works. Then, beginning in Ionia, a funny thing happened. The tyrant was Thrasybulus of Miletos. Hmm. Harbors finished, sells the public market. Business is booming. My palace couldn't be Pasha. Hot and cold running wine, live music. So what's to buy next? I want something really useless. I know, I'll get a philosopher. Hiring someone just to sit around thinking. Now there was an idea. What should I think about? Anything you like. It must have been hard at first. A raise? Is that all you can think of? Out! Ow! Censorship rears its ugly foot. The first successful thinker at Miletos was Thales, 640 to 546 BC, a Phoenician by descent. It said Thales studied the heavens and predicted eclipses, and fell down a well while stargazing. Thales speculated that the universe was made of water. It's so clear from here. Also, he figured the height of the Great Pyramid by measuring its shadow. <coughs> Proposed a central government for Ionia, rejected, and once cornered the market in olive oil by making a small down payment on every olive press in Miletos. Yes, Thales was a real speculator. Thales' student, Anaximander, rejected the idea that everything was water. You're all wet, Teach. He suggested that the Earth had evolved and people were descended from fish. Cousin, you look at fossils. 
Jesus. Anaximander also brought the sundial, a Babylonian gadget, to Greece. What was happening here? These Ionians were theorizing about the cosmos without mentioning the gods. This was novel. If animals like men could paint and make things, horses and oxen would fashion the gods in their own image, said Anaximander's contemporary Xenophanes. That's not to say the early philosophers weren't religious. Consider Pythagoras. Pythagoras began at Samus, but after a run-in with the tyrant, he fled to Italy and founded a secret brotherhood of mathematical mystics, the Pythagoreans. They believed in strict vegetarianism, the immortality of souls, and the idea or theory that number is all. Time, distance, the phone bill, all are numbers. This faith in numbers took Pythagoras into interesting areas. By studying vibrating strings, he discovered musical harmonies to be given by fixed ratios of whole numbers. The simplest example. Two notes are one octave apart if one string is half as long as the other, all else being equal. Other intervals are shown at right. In geometry, he proved the infamous and useful Pythagorean theorem. If a triangle has one right angle, then the squares on the two shorter sides add up to the square on the long side, the hypotenuse. We write c squared equals a squared plus b squared. How ideas can spread. The belief that the soul never dies was preached by Pythagoras and picked up by his Thracian slave Salmoxus, according to one ancient rumor. All is number. Soul is number. Number is eternal. Sounds logical. Salmoxus somehow gained his freedom, made a fortune, went home to Thraki, built a mansion, invited the chiefs to dinner repeatedly, and laid it on them. Death, death is a banquet. Go, Salmoxus. Then, feigning death, he had his servants bury him in a secret chamber, where he stayed for three years. They say the mourning was intense. His dinners were better than his death oh, whoa, oh, whoa. After he emerged alive in the fourth year, Salmoxus was worshipped as a god. Salmoxus is risen! How is the banquet? Grit in the spirit! So far, this wasn't much different from what the Egyptians and Babylonians had been doing for millennia. But now look. Pythagoras considered this particular right triangle. Both sides won. Then, what is C, the hypotenuse? By the theorem, C squared equals A squared plus B squared equals 1 squared plus 1 squared. So, C squared equals 2. That means C is what we call the square root of 2. But what kind of number is this? Accepting on faith that it's some kind of number, Pythagoras wondered, musically, was it in harmony with the triangle side? That is... Is the square root of 2 the ratio of two whole numbers? We'll skip his reasoning. It's not too hard, but we're out of space. And just say that Pythagoras was able to prove the answer was definitely... Oh! This means, if you want to believe that number is all, your concept of number must be extended to include more than just whole numbers and fractions. Pythagoras had proved the existence of irrational numbers. Square root of 2, square root of 3, e, pi, square root of 5, etc. Is it clear that the philosopher did something really new here? That he asked and answered a new kind of question? It was clear to him, Pythagoras considered this result so great an achievement that he sacrificed 100 bulls to the gods. Now that's rational. But enough of this bull slaughter. Last volume I promised you the Shah of Iran. And so here he is, Cyrus, King of Persia, praying to flames according to his custom and dreaming dreams of conquest. Egypt, Canaan, Syria, Assyria, Armenia, Babylonia, Iran, Afghanistan, India, Asia Minor. Thanks to Cyrus, the Persians would be the first to have them all in one all-embracing empire. What happened when the imperial armies came to Greece, that is our subject in volume 6. Next, when worlds collide. Stand back!